We will be just a few moments while they set up for the hearing. Gene. The hearing will come to order on exploring GAO's high-risk list and opportunities for reform. We on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Government Oversight and Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. Our obligation is to work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs and the GAO to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Today we are having our broadest oversight hearing that we have in any one Congress. That is because the GAO's report is, in fact, on all spending of government and all risk to government, and, in fact, is the most important report published. Each two years, General Dodaro and his, his staff assess all the risk to the government in the, in the size of the risk in dollars, but also in the likelihood of success or failure. This risk produces the top, if you will, highest threats 
It also recognizes the success that sometimes occurs because of both GAO and this committee's efforts to work with government to reduce waste and risk to government. This year, <coughs> uh, by one account, we lost $261 billion, or 7 percent of our total spending in fraud and waste. I might note that when you annualize that, or if you will, decadeize it, that represents $2.6 trillion, about twice what we are looking at for the sequestration. The 30 areas that this year are on the high-risk list represent tremendous opportunities to save those billions of dollars. And I might repeat, if we were able to save just half of what we waste, we would need no sequestration at all. As we are going to hear today, those areas extend from the Department of Defense to our weather system, from elements of, uh, related to uh, great storms such as uh, Superstorm Sandy to, in fact, the simple, mundane Medicaid, Medicare programs that every day touch our lives in important ways. <clears throat> the truth the truth is that identifying high-risk areas isn't enough anymore. It is clear that many of the areas on high-risk are perennial high-risk. Seventeen areas on this year's high-risk list have been on, the, on that list for more than a decade. Six have been on that list since inception. I don't expect overnight to fix DOD procurement. I don't expect overnight to take Medicare now becoming our largest total expense and eclipsing, if you include the dual eligible Medicare and Medicaid recipients, eclipsing both Social Security and our Department of Defense individual spending, I don't expect to fix it overnight. But with the help of the GAO on a nonpartisan basis, our committee and other committees of Congress have an opportunity to attack each of these areas and make real improvements. Our commitment is to make those real improvements. I'm pleased, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm pleased to see a, uh, a particular emphasis on the program uh, of Medicare and Medicaid, which are permanent fixtures. That in fact, this is an area of particular opportunity for reduction in, in waste, and consistent with the Affordable Health Care Act, an area of, of growth in number of recipients. The committee has just voted on a bipartisan basis on a report related specifically to New York State. During the dialogue, we mentioned an equally outlandish problem that existed in the State of Texas. These billions of dollars can no longer be tolerated. We must find them not after decades of waste and abuse, but in fact in real time. This committee will have before it today, or have before it during this Congress, an updated version of the Bipartisan Data Act. It will have an updated version or a, a version of our IT reform on a bipartisan basis. These and other systems that this committee is responsible for changes will create the opportunity to save money in IT procurement and deliver better information to decision makers. It also will create greater transparency for the GAO in their work, for Congress in its work, and for all the watchdogs of waste and abuse. So as we begin this hearing today with our esteemed uh, Controller General, we also realize there is legislative work for us to do if this list is to be successfully attacked and reduced. I look forward to working on both the legislative issues and the oversight issues with my partner, the Ranking Member, Mr. Cummings, who I now recognize for his opening statement. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. I believe this will be one of the most important hearings this committee will hold this Congress. Mr. Dodaro, I also thank you for testifying before us today, and I thank you for the work GAO put into creating this high-risk report. I also uh, ask that you expend, extend the gratitude of this entire committee for the hard work of the folks at GAO. Uh, as I said earlier in a press conference, um, they have earned the, a reputation 
for outstanding and accurate work uh, and work that helps our government function better. And so uh, we publicly say thank you to them. Um, every one of GAO's high-risk reports has been important. However, this year's report is especially significant because the Comptroller General and the nonpartisan experts at GAO have made a landmark decision to add the issue of climate change to their biannual high-risk report, which details the most pressing challenges facing our Nation and the Federal Government. In this report, GAO identifies a serious risk facing our Nation, one that we cannot continue to ignore. And GAO finds that climate change poses significant financial risk to our Nation's economy, including agriculture, infrastructure, ecosystems, and human health. GAO warns that our government is not well positioned to address this fiscal exposure, and GAO recommends a government-wide strategic approach with strong leadership and the authority to manage climate change risk. GAO finds that the government has already spent tens of billions of dollars on damage from severe weather events related to climate change. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, over the past two years, the United States has experienced 25 weather disasters that cost over a billion dollars each. GAO's historic decision to add climate change to the list of high-risk challenges fa facing our Nation is a wake-up call for Congress to finally start addressing this very, very critical issue. Unfortunately, in the last Congress, the House Republicans voted 37 times to block action to address the threat of climate change. For example, they slashed climate change research funding by more than $100 million. They voted to pre prevent the State Department from using funds to send a special envoy for climate change to international climate negotiations. They voted to zero out the United States' contribution to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the world's leading authority on climate change science. They voted to prohibit the Department of Homeland Security from using any funds to participate in the Interagency Climate Change Ab Adaptation Task Force. And they voted to prohibit the Department of Agriculture from using any funds to implement its climate change adaptation program. What GAO is telling us today is that Congress simply cannot afford to block or delay action any longer. We must act now to implement GAO's recommendations and mitigate the risks from climate change. For these reasons, I sent a letter to Chairman Issa today requesting that our committee hold a series of hearings to address each of the four specific areas that GAO highlights in its reports relating to climate change. And in an earlier press conference, Chairman Issa, I thought, made a very good point, and that is uh, perhaps we should look at what responsibilities States are playing with regard to climate change and what responsibility they should have. And uh, I am hoping that we, as I said to him earlier, maybe we will have some governors to come in and talk about their responsibility and things that they are doing to prepare for uh, 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 weather-type problems uh, that might affect their States. Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> when we were here two years ago, considering GAO's uh, high, last high-risk report in 2011, you said it is our committee's obligation to conduct vigorous oversight over the issues raised by GAO and to assist on plans to change by each of the agencies listed here today. I agree then and I agree now. With our committee's extremely wide jurisdiction across multiple Federal agencies and departments, we have a very unique opportunity to conduct hearings that will lead to vigorous oversight, responsible funding and decisions and legislation to address the growing threats of, to public health in our economy. As the President noted the other night in his State of the Union, uh, we have seen uh, in the last uh, 10 or 15 years um, just an onslaught of weather-related uh, problems. And I am hoping that we all will work together closely to prepare for the fiscal impact of those uh, problems. Uh, and with that, I stand ready, willing, and able to work with the Chairman, and with that, I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman, and as we did discuss, uh, I, I believe we need to kick off the first hearing related to that risk, and I look forward to scheduling that hearing and also suggesting that other committees of jurisdiction uh, do their oversight related specifically uh, to those areas. And with that, thank you. And with now, that, we now recognize our first witness and the panel behind him. I am pleased to welcome the Honorable Jean Dodaro, who is the Controller General of the United States. He also comes with a small sampling of his team of experts from the United States Government Accountability Office that is here today. And I will try not to mess up your names, but if you if would rise just so that the audience can know that he came with a tremendous amount of expertise. Uh, Chris Mim is the Managing Director of Strategic Issues at the GAO. Mark uh, Gaffigan is Managing Director of Natural Resources and Environment at the GAO. Kathleen Barrick is Managing Director of Homeland Security and Justice Issues at the GAO. Philip Herr is Managing Director of Fiscal Infrastructure Issues at the GAO. That is physical, actually. Uh, <clears throat> Arise Williams Brown is Managing Director of Financial Markets, an area of particular concern, and Community Investment at the GAO, and Mr. David ba Power is Director of Information Technology and, Man Managing Sy and Management Systems at the GAO. And I am now going to ask you all to stand, because if you are going to help the General, you may very well be a witness. Would you please raise your right hands and repeat, or do you, pursuant to the committee rules, please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let, let, let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. And uh, normally we, we have that five minute clock. For your reference, we will have it. If you run a little over, you are the whole show today. So, Gene, you are recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Cummings. Members of the uh, committee, I am very pleased to be invited today to talk about GAO's high-risk list update. Uh, we do this update, as noted, every two years with the beginning of each new Congress in order, in order to identify areas that we believe are at highest risk of waste, fraud, abuse and mismanagement or are in need of broad-based reform. Uh, I am very pleased to report, with this committee's help, and I appreciate their your support, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Cummings, and committee members of oversight since our last report in 2011, that notable progress has been made in the vast majority of areas on the high risk list. Uh, this has been due in part to legislation passed by the Congress. For example, the FDA uh, Authorization Act addressed many issues that GAO had recommended for improvements. Uh, to oversight of medical products and devices, for example, uh, uh, dealing with drug shortages uh, and also increased inspections, risk-based in foreign operations. Uh, Congress also passed important legislation concerning the flood insurance program, which is also on our list. Also, OMB and the agencies have been holding regular meetings with GAO, which I part uh, personally participate in in order to focus on solutions and, and to identify ways to make the necessary improvements to get off of the list. Uh, this year, enough progress has been made that we are removing two items from the list. Uh, first is interagency contracts. Interagency contract can actually be a very good and important management tool if done properly. We found uh, back in 2005 they were not done very well. They were out of scope uh, in terms of the contracts lack of competition. One of the most notable examples was the hiring of interrogators for Iraq using an IT contract. Uh, since then, important procedures have been put in place. Agencies have fixed the problems. The Congress has required the Federal Acquisition Regulations to be reformed for best procurement decisions uh, and also requiring a business case before new interagency contracts are put in place and better data now is being collected in those areas. So we believe uh, that there are adequate mechanisms in place in order to help manage this very important tool to help the government uh, leverage its buying power. Secondly, 
Uh, we are removing the IRS business system modernization from the list. It was originally put on in 1995 due to the IRS being mired uh, with management and technical problems with their modernization effort. They have made steady progress over the years. They have just deployed the first module of the system, which allowed us now daily updating of taxpayer accounts, uh, which will improve taxpayer service and also their enforcement uh, activities as well. We have reviewed their investment management practices and found about 80 percent of them meet uh, best practices, and all of their project management recommendations uh, do that. Their software development uh, uh, component now has been rated at a computer maturity model level 3 under the Software Engineering Institute standards, which means it is a, a good level by industry standards. Uh, two important points I would make with these areas we are taking off the list. One, uh, we continue to monitor those areas after they are off the list. So they may be off the list, but they are not about, out of sight. Uh, and so we make sure that the progress that has been gained is enduring. Uh, secondly, uh, like the other areas that eventually come off the list, they come off because of two major reasons. One is sustained congressional oversight. And oversight and the interagency contracting, Congress uh, insisted on important reforms, required the IGs to do uh, continual reviews in this area. In the IRS area, Congress required an annual expenditure plan from IRS every year and a GAO review. And so uh, continued congressional oversight can pay enormous dividends in resolving many of these problems. The two new areas we are adding this year, uh, one is limiting the Federal Government's fiscal exposure by better managing climate change risk. Uh, it is clear the number of uh, disasters have gone from in 2004 to the Federal Government intervening in 65 to 98 in 2012, which is a record number of years. Uh, there are indications that the severe weather events, uh, both by the National Academy of Sciences and by the government's Global Change uh, Management Research Program, that there will be more events occurring and more costly events. Uh, the Federal Government has enormous exposure to these risks. First, uh, it is one of the largest property holders in the government or in the nation. There are hundreds of thousands of buildings uh, and, that the Federal Government owns and also defense installations uh, along our coastlines. Uh, also, the Federal Government holds 29 percent of the property uh, in uh, the, the United States and manages that property. Also manages the flood and crop insurance programs, which we have recommended take into account uh, climate science issues in revamping those programs. We found that, the, and the government is also the provider of disaster aid, over $80 billion over the past year and before the assistance for Hurricane Sandy. We found that the uh, criteria for the Federal Government intervening in a disaster is an artificially low level. It is based on $1.36 per person per state. So any a uh, disaster that exceeds that threshold gets Federal assistance, and it had not been adjusted for inflation for a 13-year period of time. Had it been adjusted for inflation, the Federal Government would have uh, intervened in 25 percent less uh, situations in terms of the Federal Government deciding to, to get involved. Uh, the, we have recommended that the Federal Government needs a better strategic plan for this area that sets priorities to guide investments decisions. Individual agencies have plans, but there is no overall central direction uh, and uh, 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 priorities that are set for that area and coordinate at the Federal level or with the State and local government. I know, Mr. Chairman, you made that point this morning. That is in our report. It is very important that the Federal Government provide technical information on weather-related issues to State and local government to guide their investment decisions in huge amounts of infrastructure. Uh, the Federal uh, flood insurance programs and the crop insurance programs need to be reformed, and we need to set better criteria uh, that takes into account the Federal Government's fiscal condition right now. The last area we added uh, on the list is gaps in weather satellite information uh, due to management problems and acquisition problems over the years. Right now, the gaps in the polar orbiting satellites that provide early midday and afternoon warnings uh, to feed uh, computer weather prediction models. 
uh, and uh, to provide the three-, four-, and seven-day forecast has a potential for a gap to occur as early as 2014 and could last up to 53 months. This is very important. Uh, without that information, you know, one credible organization has said that the information from the polar orbiting satellites, the prediction of the path for Superstorm Sandy would have shown it going out to sea and not hitting New Jersey at all. And so without this critical information, uh, there are property, lives, economic consequences, and so we are adding this area to our high risk list. We have, at our recommendation, contingency plans have been developed. Uh, but they need to be executed, monitored properly, and I think congressional oversight could be very beneficial and necessary in this area. Uh, so, Mr. Chairman, that concludes my broad overview of the major changes on the list. Uh, there are 30 items now remaining on the list, and I would be happy to answer questions. Thank you. And I will now recognize myself for a few quick questions. Uh, first of all, my understanding from your report uh, is that the FDA has not really solved its problem of meeting its responsibility for drug availability, that that continues to be an area in which the American people cannot count on both generic uh, antibiotics or chemotherapy drugs being in proper supply based on this failure. Is that correct? Uh, they still have to uh, step up and make some changes in order to do that. Congress now has given them the authority to have drug manufacturers notify them in advance of shortages, which is a very important step and consistent with a prior GAO recommendation. But they must follow through. And once they have that information, they must then take action. So we are going to carefully continue to monitor uh, that situation, uh, Mr. Chairman. There are also uh, areas that we have pointed out where they need to make sure that they uh, do post-market studies to make sure the recalls are done properly as well. So both those areas are on our radar screen. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Uh, your concern on FHA, if I understand correctly, is that because they issue effectively zero-down loans, very similar to the loans that got us in trouble with Freddie and Fannie, uh, they are technically 4 percent, but after you look at sort of closing costs, they are really zero-down, that any reduction in home values even short term, could put FHA in a similar situation to Freddie and Fannie. Is that correct? Their, their uh, financial situation is precarious. Uh, there is high risk. Their capital reserve ratio is below the levels that it needs to be. And so we have added it to the list uh, to highlight that and also the fact that in resolving the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae situation and taking them out of conservatorship, which the Congress still has to do, we have modernizing the financial regulatory system on the list, that FHA situation needs to take, uh, be taken into account. There will be an integrated set of activities there uh, so that uh, we don't increase the risk even further to FHA. And I will summarize, if you will, from the way I heard it. You don't fix Freddie and Fannie unless you fix FHA at the same time, that, that they, they are all, if you will, subsidized or, uh, opportunities that could lead to the Federal Government putting up billions of dollars again if anything goes wrong. That is exactly right. It is all about solving what the Federal Government's proper role should be in the housing market. And uh, if I understand correctly, when you said that uh, by not indexing uh, this $1.36 per capita, that 25 percent would not even have made the list. Effectively, what you are saying is we have shifted 25 percent more things which are in constant dollars, State responsibility. We have shifted them onto the Federal back, uh, and that is a substantial amount of billions of dollars. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And we have recommended that if uh, FEMA revise the criteria to take into account State's capability to be able to pay there as well. And they have agreed with the recommendation, but I think congressional follow-up would be helpful. appreciate that. And I guess, lastly, uh, along the same line, if, if, in fact, we continue to see water levels rise around our, our, our coastlines, which represent about half of our States, uh, effectively, you have looked at, at Federal installations as one of the risk areas. In other words, we need to build and plan 
both naval and other military installations and Federal property, uh, based on the assumption that, if you will, things change and where you built uh, one, two, three hundred years ago, because some of our forts are just that, they are revolutionary period forces, need to be planned uh, in a way. It, 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 essentially, you are calling for internal zoning that the Federal Government begins making decisions that uh, abate likely changes in water levels and storms and so on. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, the Defense Department has already recognized this risk and beginning to act on that. In fact, the Congress also recognized this risk when it passed the Bigger uh, Waters Act this past uh, year. In fact, that uh, FEMA before was prohibited from taking into account uh, erosion over time. And now Congress has required that climate science be included in FEMA's further efforts on the flood insurance program. Where is and, it? Yeah, please. And back to the flood insurance portion. Uh, my understanding is that both of our major insurance programs ha are not run in a way in which the private sector would run their insurance, meaning we don't adjust our rates to meet the likely payout. Instead, they are fixed in time, and so they can year after year after year come up short, ultimately shifting to the taxpayer the responsibility for paying out what should be insurance by the insured. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, we have recommended they use better practices. They have agreed to do that. They have contracted for studies, but the results haven't yet been provided to the Congress. And this is very important. And the flood insurance program, even before Superstorm Sandy, the flood insurance program owed the Federal Government back over $20 billion. The likelihood of that getting repaid is, is not high. Well, I certainly, in closing, would say that if I could be insured for the less than the risk, I would always buy that insurance. I recognize the gentleman from Maryland for his opening or for his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dodaro, um, let me uh, go to page 202 of your report where uh, you talk about the drug shortages. I want to pick up on some of the things that the Chairman was asking you about. Um, you know, we did some preliminary uh, research uh, uh, and looked into this area of drug shortages. Um, and drugs that were life-saving drugs, chemotherapy drugs. And one of the things that we found in our uh, research was that we had a gray market going on out there where a drug might start out from the manufacturer at costing $7 a vial, and by the end of the week, because of the gray market, maybe selling for $700 a vial. Uh, we also had an opportunity to talk to doctors uh, from all over the country. As a matter of fact, one doctor from South Carolina, I'll never forget it, she came in and she uh, is at a major uh, medical facility, and she said, sadly, we are uh, performing medicine like we are in a third world country because of the shortages. And so it is a major, major area. And I, I noticed your comments, but I am just wondering, did you go, did, did you all look into at all the gray market situation where people are improperly ratcheting up and, uh, and hoarding drugs and then jacking up the costs so that we have got hospitals and that, the American uh, Hospital Association now saying that 99 percent of their hospitals have drug shortages? I mean, did you all look at that at all, or you just looked at it from an FDA monitoring standpoint? We, we primarily looked at it from an FDA monitoring standpoint. I can go back and double check, Mr. Chairman. If we have looked into the gray market issue, I will provide something for the record. Yeah, well, we may, you may want to look at that because, I mean, you, you, made, some, you, know, you made some very uh, good comments here uh, on page 202. Um, but we also, I think, to just look at it from an FDA monitoring standpoint is, you know, perhaps I mean, that is good, but if we have an underlying cause of greedy people uh, on a daily basis literally taking drugs out of the hands of Hopkins, of, of a hospital ranked number one in the world, in my district, Johns Hopkins, they have told me this, and they can't have the best drugs possible to treat our constituents because people are hoarding them and then putting them on the gray market and jacking them up a hundred times, that is a major problem that goes to so many things, to our economy, of course. It jacks up the cost of medicine. 
it, it, uh, detri it's a detriment to many of our constituents with regard to health care. So I just want you to, and would you give me something back on that to let me know sure. how deep you went into it? One of the things I think the Chairman was saying was uh, making a, a part of our uh, scope of inquiry this, uh, this, 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 month, this uh, session, uh, the next two years, is looking not only at the FDA piece of this, but looking at the, uh, this whole thing of the gray market. And so I would really like to sit down with you if you haven't delved into it and, t and see where, you know, what we might be able to do together to try to get to the bottom of that, because it is a very, very serious problem. A lot of Americans do not even know about it, but it is very serious. I want to uh, very briefly go to this whole issue of uh, climate change. GAO recognizes that the Federal Government has a number of efforts underway to decrease domestic greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the, the success of greenhouse gas emission reduction efforts depends in large part on cooperative international efforts. However, limiting the Federal Government's fiscal exposure to climate change uh, risks will uh, present a challenge no matter the outcome of the domestic and international efforts to reduce emissions, in part because greenhouse gases already in the atmosphere will continue altering the, the climate system for many decades. So if I understand this correctly, the carbon emissions that are in our atmosphere are already altering the climate system and will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. Is that correct? Uh, based on the information from the Government Global Climate Change uh, Research Program and the National Academy of Sciences, that is correct. Uh, is the GAO's opinion that regardless of the outcome of global negotiations to reduce carbon emissions, the United States Government should take immediate action to mitigate the risk posed by the climate change? Yes. Now, you heard the President's uh, testimony last the other night is in the State of the Union where he talked about these catastrophic weather-related incidents seeming to come at a greater pace and costing us billions upon billions of dollars. Um, what are you, just as, I, as you close with my questioning, tell us what you are recommending, again, for us to do with regard to these uh, catastrophic types of things, storms like Sandy, that is costing us so much and causing such much inconvenience to our citizens? Uh, there are several things. One, we think the Federal Government needs to be better organized. There needs to be a better coordinated effort among Federal departments and agencies with a strategic plan and a focus on priorities. We looked at all the Federal spending. The Federal Government is already spending a lot of money on these areas, but it is not well coordinated and it is not targeted and prioritized. So that is number one particularly important in our budget environment right now, where we have to make every dollar count. We have to make the best investments possible. Second, we need to partner with the State and local governments. We need to provide them better weather-related information. They are already making huge investments with their own money and with the Federal Government's money in infrastructure. So in terms of figuring out how to deal with roads, bridges, tunnels, et cetera, and provide adequate proper interpretation or, uh, of the science data and make those decisions, that is very important. We need to get our act together on our flood insurance program and our crop insurance programs and to make sure that that is developed properly. And we need to look at how we provide and what the criteria is for when we intervene in disaster assistance or whether it should be a State and local responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the ranking member. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Micah, for five minutes. Well, thank you. And I am pleased that our committee is uh, looking at uh, GAO's 2013 high-risk list. Um, this list is uh, probably a, a good uh, template for looking at ways in which we could have dramatic uh, savings. Right now we are practically bankrupt, approaching $16.5 trillion in debt. Uh, I was wondering, sir, if you could tell me this list is pretty extensive. It is a lot of bad news. There is a little bit of good news you shared and a couple coming off the list. But wouldn't you estimate that there could be tens of billion dollars in savings from the recommendations uh, in, in these high-risk areas that you have provided? Yeah, that is true. Yeah. And, and I think that is why it is so important our, our work uh, continue. Um, while they are focusing some on this uh, one report that our committee has uh, produced, it is uh, 
billions of dollars in Medicare misspent on New York. Uh, anyway, everyone should read that. See, it is tens of billions of dollars of uh, wasteful spending, uh, programs out of control. A program, Medicare, which is so important to provide those that need health care, and in New York alone, tens of billions of dollars uh, outlined here, wasted. Uh, have you seen this uh, report, sir? No, I have I hope not. you do and uh, would confirm that. Now, I don't have, I, I chair a small uh, government operations subcommittee, particularly interested in the managing Federal real property. Uh, we have heard you testify and others that we own thousands, tens of thousands of building structures, the biggest uh, property owner in the world probably. Twenty-nine percent of all the Federal, pro of all the property in the United States is either owned or managed by the United States, according to your report. Is that correct? That is correct. Well, uh, we are going to do some hearings. We will probably start with uh, uh, the risk of high risk list uh, that you have provided us in managing Federal property and look at it. I have been at it a week or two. Uh, I went out. Uh, well, what is stunning is, and uh, we did a little bit of this in the Transportation Committee, nobody has control. I was, in, uh, I was in real estate. I think the last folks I'd ever give anything to manage would be the Federal Government, uh, including assets. Would you give your uh, real estate or assets to the Federal Government to manage? Uh, only with great many conditions. <laughs> Well, we went out last uh, week and looked at a million square feet of space in Springfield, and I just looked at it from a, a management standpoint. You have got a million square feet, a lot of acreage in Springfield, Virginia, uh, not well utilized. Uh, uh, does anyone look at the specific um, properties with the management plan or the best utilization of that asset for realization of taxpayer dollars? Is there there, we have been, been encouraging better oversight over that issue. And but wait, I don't yeah, see yeah. it. I mean, yeah. I could go through right. that, and I, if, as a property manager, right. to have that valuable asset there, it might have made sense 20 years ago, but not today. Then the other day we went out and looked at 7,000 acres, nearly 7,000 acres in Maryland, Mr. Uh, Cummings. And we have an agricultural research center there dating back from maybe the turn of the century. They have 500 buildings, of which uh, uh, there are 200 that either need to be demolished or are unusable. What stunned me is there was no plan for utilization of either the acreage or the facilities. Do you know of a plan to? Uh, uh, or do we have any mechanism to even require an agency to have a plan uh, to deal with those assets? Yeah, we have been made recommendations along those lines. One, one of the things that we found is that when we went out and did the type of inspections that you are talking about doing, the data didn't match what was in the, the database. Well, they said I was the first okay. member of Congress, I think, since Mr. Yeah. Hoyer to go out there. Yeah. But it is at Beltsville. It is right on the, the I know capital where circle. About. Right. And nobody has a clue. I mean, there is an incredible asset sitting there. In fact, I think some prohibitions have been put on uh, doing anything, which just is mind-boggling, uh, again, from somebody who's dealt in real estate in the private sector. So I think uh, we're going to work with you all to see if we can't get some of these agencies to have plans to maximize those uh, those assets and utilize them. The lease, uh, uh, you, you po point out in your uh, report here, lost $200 million in leases uh, uh, since 2005. Uh, uh, it, it, again, um, it is only a quarter of a billion here and a quarter billion there. But we are bankrupting the nation through uh, policies and practices and uh, lack of attention to uh, maximizing our assets. So we will be back. I think we are going to try to do this on February 27th and we'll work with the minority to uh, mm -hmm. set a date and launch uh, a little bit more in depth on this sure. report. And we thank you and you others uh, for working with us. Yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, and Mr. Darrow, I want to thank you for uh, what is always an illuminating report, but particularly for adding uh, climate change for the first time as a risk for the Federal Government. Um, this has come 
uh, at a time when it could not be more needed. We needed the imprimatur of a objective government agency. Climate change is not political, and we make it political at our own risk. I recall uh, in the past two Congresses we have been dealing with a um, uh, hundred-year flood. That is kind of, kind of a silly thing to even think about calling it now. And even as we did uh, label it hundred-year flood and force states uh, to update uh, how, uh, what, how they go about preparing for flooding, we recognized that a hundred years was, not, it was, was, was a term of to, to, to simply to make people understand uh, what was regarded as a rare uh, event, in, at, at least in terms of floods. Well, we have gone from rare to routine and to unheard of. Um, sadly, during the, uh, after Sandy, there was a very contentious debate in, in here <laughs> about what to do. And I think part of that comes from the unpredictability of budgeting for such events. Now, nothing of the kind in, in memory had been seen by New York State. So there was no way to plan for that, and there was certainly no way to uh, budget for that. Uh, it was so unusual, or to take another example, shortly after that, was it last week, that we had the snowstorm that went all the way up into New England, and then it had a, a, a wind currents that resembled a hurricane. You know, try preparing for that. Uh, and yet, you name ways in which we are highly vulnerable, not only what we own, but the assistance we give, the dependence of the States on us, uh, emergency aid and the rest. This is very, very troubling. And what my, my question goes to when we, <laughs> we, we it is easier to predict a recession <laughs> uh, or a downturn in the economy than it is to predict one of these events. We see flowers growing in the wintertime. <laughs> we don't know whether tomorrow is going to bring uh, springtime weather uh, or a snowstorm. Um, and so finally, the country which, uh, when climate change was first discussed, the majority of the American people said, yes, we, we think <laughs> there is climate change and so, something has to be done about it. The last um, 12 or 18 months uh, has produced a comeback in the public on an understanding of climate change. You can understand during the recession that people didn't want to, said they no longer, quote, believed in. I don't understand the nomenclature of believing in when it comes to science. I, I need to know from you, you know what our budget, how our budgets, of course, are, um, are developed. Uh, it is one, and I accept what you say about the coordination of the Federal agencies and the rest, but I have to ask you, Mr. Darrow, how do you budget for the uh, unfathomable and avoid partisan debate when they come up? I mean, I heard some members from New York who had never seen a disaster So you just wait. To, to, I don't know, somebody from Mississippi got up and opposed it. Well, that is one of the parts of the country that does not need to get up on its hind legs uh, about this issue, because we have readily come forward time and time again. I said, I hope that is not the way you look at it. I hope the way you look at it is to use it as an example by voting for what happens in Mississippi, Louisiana, or some tor tornado someplace where it is unheard of. But I don't accept that the present budget process is at all uh, responsive to this new world of climate change. And I wonder if you could give us some help right. uh, on, on how to go up about, uh, in a budget world in which we live, making these, bu the, these, these, um, th these funds available wherever they occur uh, rather quickly without the kind of contentious debate we had here over Sandy. Yes. Uh, there are two things I would say. First, that we should not pretend that disasters do not occur in our budgeting process, which right now we do not budget for anything uh, that might occur. Now, there is a historical record here uh, that shows over time how much we have always uh, you know, provided over a period of time. So you have historical data that could be used to provide, you know, in anybody's budget, a household budget or whatever, you would have a contingency plan. We don't have contingency plans in our budgeting process. You mean even for the kinds of disasters that could be expected? Right. That is correct. 
And, and well, let's begin there, I guess. That's, that's a starting point. Uh, secondly, uh, we can revisit this criteria for what we decided the Federal Government to pay for and what not to pay for and what should be absorbed at the State and local level. It is badly in need of modernization and upgrading, so that could give you a better indication for budgeting purposes as well. Third, we need better data uh, on weather-related potential changes, good science data that could be objectively collected and provided to State and local governments and the Federal Government to make investment decisions to justify budgetary investments that will then yield proper information in the future. And then we will have to, you know, there is going to be obviously things always that are going to come up that you don't expect, but right now we are pretending we don't expect anything, and that is not reality. Well, we do budget. We do budget in expectations that there will be hurricanes in the West, and that fund, then, then we are told that fund has been used up right, by right. the most recent hurricane. Right, right. And, and there are re revisions that are made after disasters are in place about the additional money that is needed during that period of time. There's not, the budgeting system is in need of reform for these type of efforts. I, I agree completely with your view. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank the gentlelady. Uh, the Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Chaffetz, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for being here and the great work that uh, so many people do within the agency. It is a critical role to have the oversight and the understanding of the audits that go on. I want to try to touch on three topics, if I can. I wanted to start with the uh, uh, Federal Real Property. Um, I, I have introduced a bill with uh, Mr. Quigley, H.R. 328, to try to dispose of these properties. But could you give me some further insight that the number has greatly fluctuated on the number of underutilized buildings? It, it, not too recent, or fairly recently, uh, the GAO had estimated the uh, 45,000 properties that are underutilized. That number is now 71,000 uh, that are underutilized. Yet the uh, annual operating costs remain at about a billion five. What, why, why the fluctuation? I want to ask uh, Mr. Hur to answer that question. That'd be great. Uh, uh, Congressman Chaffetz, it is one of the areas we have done work in recently was looking at the Federal Rural Property Database that GSA and OMB maintain. And we found that, it, as, uh, as the Comptroller General mentioned, there is a lot of inaccuracies in that. And we have been pushing and working with them to really update. When you say a lot, are we talking by the tens of thousands? Or are we well, one of the challenges is because of the nature of the sample we took last year and looking at that there is about 400,000 properties and there is another 400,000 structures not including the Postal Service. So getting a comprehensive view of that, our suggestion and recommendation is GSA and the agencies do a better job of looking at their inventories to have a better but, sense. Uh, give me, I, I need, I'm looking for more specifics on, I mean, it just seems to me that we ought to be able to pull up a list at any given time and be able to see all the real property that this country has. We, we can't do it even within my state of Utah, right. uh, uh, the real property just in the state. So why? I, we don't even know what we own. That's, there is a, there, that's part of the challenge. In fact, Mr. Micah mentioned the, uh, the facility out at USDA in Beltsville. Uh, we had a team visit there last year to highlight some of the problems that he was mentioning. But this is part of the challenge, is getting your hands how, on How that. inaccurate is it? Are we missing 1 percent? I, well, I, it's, it, we, based on your sample, how, yeah, how inaccurate yeah, we, was it? talk about the ones we looked at. Well, the ones we looked at, we found errors, for example, in terms of the valuation of the properties. Uh, but in terms of doing a, a sample that we could uh, generalize statistically across the country, we weren't able to do that given the sheer numbers involved and what it would take to do a generalizable sample. Yeah, but but in, this, in, this, in the sample we did look at, we found a significant number of errors. I'll provide the, inf the specifics to you. That would be great. But, because but, but I, was, I was concerned enough with the level of errors that we found in the small sample uh, to be concerned enough to make the recommendations. I would have liked to have had a projectable one. Uh, but we just don't have the resources to do that. GSA is taking a broader sample and looking. We have not seen their results yet. Uh, so we will follow up on and provide those to you as well. That would be great. I mean, clearly it is on the high risk list. This is why you are highlighting and you talk about the inaccuracy of the data. What I am concerned about is in, in a, a 24 month period or so, you went from 45,000 properties to 71,000 uh, properties, that, that, that's not a small jump in the, and we are talking about real property here. This is, uh, these are big, big assets and lots of, but the dollar didn't change. Uh, you, you still projected $1.5 billion, and, and, it's, and yet the number jumped by, by about 50 per plus percent. So that is just a concern that I would like to continue to follow up on. And I just, 
physically don't understand how the GSA lost $200 million on leases since 2005, including $75 million in 2011 alone. I mean, that's, that's why these departments are used, the GSA, is to make sure that we don't make these kinds of mistakes. How, how does that happen? Uh, well, one of the areas that we have identified is that agencies do not do a good job of sharing resources. For example, there may be Federal agencies located in one area. They are not uh, uh, really uh, looking and being encouraged to share space or minimize their space use and bring in other agencies to, to uh, work with them. Well, and one of the you know, I don't have a Federal building in my congressional district, but I know that as we looked at just our own office space, it was unbelievable how much more expensive going with the Federal building in Salt Lake City would be. I mean, it was ridiculous, so much so that I believe our Senator said, I am not paying that rate. That's, I can't afford it. And if they just simply go across, uh, you know, grow across the street, they would save significant dollars in doing so. So I appreciate looking at that. I, Mr. Chairman, I was going to look at three different topics. We barely got through one. So but I don't want to hog the time. I know Mr. Gowdy is anxious with, with 20 minutes' worth of questions. So I will yield back the balance of my time. I thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, uh, General Dodaro. Um, Mr. Dodaro, uh, uh, on page 88 of the report, you talk about the high risk of the Postal Service. Yes. Uh, did you at any time consult with the general counsel of your organization with respect to the legality of the announced proposed action of the Postmaster General having the legal authority to go from six to five days a week? I, I, after the decision was announced, I have asked our attorneys to look at the information. They have talked to the Postal Service and have obtained their uh, legal analysis. Uh, they believe the argument to be novel, uh, but we would have to look at it more carefully in order to provide uh, a full legal opinion on the issue. I don't want to uh, box you in. so. What I hear you saying is that your attorneys, your general counsel and, your, and yourself are still weighing the legal arguments coming from the Postmaster General. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Would it be fair to say, however, that informally the general counsel of your organization has expressed, for example, to the committee staff of this committee some skepticism as to the legal reasoning behind the Postmaster General's announcement? Well, I, I don't want to speculate informally on anything. I mean, one of the reasons, the, the, one of the things. I'm not that, asking yeah, you to. Uh, right, excuse well, me, yeah, General. Yeah. I'm not asking you to speculate. Yeah. Did or did not such an informal conversation, in fact, take place with the staff of this committee? Well, one of the things we do is ask a lot of questions. So it might have. Uh, uh, I'm sure they had asked questions about the uh, the issues. So. Well, let let me uh, certainly we would welcome. Um, your opinion when you are ready to render it. There are many of us here who think it is an illegal act. Um, and this is a nation of laws, and even the Postmaster General of the United States has to follow the law. Um, but it is in your report. I think it is a relevant question, and we would very much welcome your opinion uh, before Congress acts. Um, climate change, General Dodaro. Uh, what made you decide to add that this year? What, what about the science and or the potential consequences of climate change made you decide to, and I applaud you for doing it, but made you decide this year it, it, it merited inclusion in, the, in this very thoughtful report? Yeah, well, there, there were several things. One, we had issued uh, at least three critical reports over the past two-year period, one on the disaster aid limitation, one looking at the finding uh, uh, the funding uh, of the Federal Government by climate change um, uh, issues and finding there was no strategic direction in the climate change area. Obviously, we also looked at the number of disasters that have been occurring. Uh, we, the flood insurance programs already on the high risk list. We were concerned about gaps in weather satellite coverages, and so we decided to take a, you know, a broader look at these, at these issues. Uh, and uh, I felt also, given the Federal Government's precarious financial si situation, that it couldn't afford not to try to limit its fiscal exposure uh, in, uh, in the future in those areas. Those are the factors that I considered. But, but 
as a, uh, a, a sort of a, a preface to all of that, there is a certain operating assumption that the science is fairly compelling. What we uh, take the information from the National Science Academy of Sciences and the Global Climate Change Research Program uh, at, at FAITH. And, and we're, we're, uh, the important point here is that we are not questioning what may or may not be causing the situation. We are saying that science shows there is an issue and we, have and, to and we, need, and we need to do something yeah. about it. We are not getting into the policy areas of where there needs to be uh, changes and how we, how we mitigate whatever might be causing this, so, you know, we're, 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 you know, or, or the international issues that need to be done. We are right. saying we have a problem, uh, we need to deal with it and try to limit our exposure. Yeah, I am sure you are aware of the fact that there are some, even here in the Congress, who don't even go as far as you do, however, who still are denying the science and are denying there is a problem. Um, let me ask, uh, in your analysis, risk analysis, have you also looked at the military base, especially naval base implications? I, I think of, for example, Norfolk. We are in Virginia. Many of us are very worried that sea rise could jeopardize you know, the oldest and largest naval base in the United States, uh, as well as facilities in Florida, possibly even South Carolina. Um, have you looked at that in terms of dollars and cents, relocation costs? Uh, uh, you know, uh, reinforcing costs, whatever it may be, to try to protect those facilities. Yeah, we, we note the Defense Department vulnerability in the report. Uh, we will plan to do more work on those issues uh, going forward in this in this area. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I, I would I know the committee would welcome that as well, especially dollars and cents implications, uh, because I think. Uh, I think some people may be very surprised at what we are looking at. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The uh, chair uh, now recognizes uh, Dr. Gozar from Arizona for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the General, thank you very, very much. Um, I am going to harp again. Um, being a health care provider, I want to ask you more about these drug shortages. Do you think that your recommendations to the FDA are sufficient to mitigate this problem? Uh, I believe so. Um, we have uh, made those recommendations uh, just to reiterate that they need to strengthen their program by assessing their, their resources, systematically tracking data on shortages concerning the availability of medically necessary drugs, the strategic priority, and developing relevant results-oriented uh, performance measures. Well, let me so, ask you a question. Yeah. Do you believe that the FDA is part of the problem? They need to make changes. To, to they be need to make big, some big changes. Big, big change, to be part of the solution to the problem. Well, I think um, yeah. part of our problem, I am looking here at a drug recall or, or uh, a drug in stock uh, affidavit as of yesterday. I mean, we have got problems with uh, liquid ibuprofen, we have got problems with anesthetics. Um, this is critical mass because we are putting patients in harm's way and physicians in harm's way, making them use um, uh, uh, protocols and medications that are, in many cases, got substantial more side effects uh, and problems uh, for patients. This is critical mass. It is not just with uh, pharmaceuticals, but also um, um, our medical devices. We have reached a saturation point where I will disagree with you. I do not think that what you have put out here in your, ta in your uh, outlines are suitable for reform. I think we need to have thorough FDA reforms in regards to not only drug manufacturing, but FDA's role and oversight. Um, you look at, you know, in your report, you cite globalization. You know, we don't even control a, a vast amount of some of the products that go into manufacturing of these drugs or um, uh, 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 medical devices. And we're becoming problematic that we're dependent upon so many other countries to do that. Do, do you, would you agree with that? Uh, well, it's one of the reasons they're on the high risk list is due to the, the globalization. I have uh, this Marshall. Well, it seems to me like what we're doing yeah. here is we're yeah. we have a disease here, and what we're right. doing with this report is we're treating the symptoms, but we're not treating the disease. The di di part of the disease process is the FDA itself. And it seems to me that what we need to do here is reform the FDA. Would you agree with that? Well, I definitely think there needs to be changes. Do you think we need legislation to refer that? To I, make that I, I'd be happy to provide our recommendations for the record. Okay. Um, one of the other things I did want to touch about, um, I mean, in these drug shortages, I've got to tell you, this, this affidavit just came from Tucson. 
and, and from the Northeast. So it's not specific just to rural or urban areas. Mm -hmm. These are critical shortages that have to be addressed. And I don't like the, uh, I don't think that the, the, uh, uh, the hypothesis or the conclusions you come to are real. I think we are actually in worse shortages. Because just because we put out a report doesn't mean that um, we have remedied it. We have actually made some of the problems even worse for the gray market. Now we understand where we hoard, where we take, where we, where we increase the sales. So we got a huge problem here. To go back to my uh, colleague, uh, Mr. Chaffetz, um, in Federal properties, I want to give you a real clear example of Federal properties that have a problem. We just got back from a CODEL um, in regards to the State Department looking at our, our embassies. And in particular, I want to highlight Morocco. Here we are spending over $150 million building a new embassy in Morocco. And we have yet to assay and look at what the value um, uh, and possibility of sale of our current embassy. Right there to me, it seems like in looking at properties, I am not a real estate expert, but it seems to me that when we are making a transaction like that, we are looking at in the neighborhood of somewhere of 60 to 80 million dollars in assets that need to have some assaying. Do you know that they had to beg? And as of, they were about, I would say, would you say it's about 50 percent completed that embassy, Chairman? I would say that's yes. correct. They had yet to have an assay of the current buildings and, and inventory of properties that they had in Morocco. I find that disdainful. This is an instant turnaround of quickly $80 million, and we shouldn't be building unless we actually know what we have as an inventory and make sure that we are selling it. That is disrespectful for the American taxpayer. I am just giving you one example. Extrapolate it to, to Great Britain. It is my understanding we are building another embassy for a billion dollars there. What other assets do we have there? I mean, this is critical mass that can turn money very, very quickly, and I think that is what we demand of that. So I think some of the things that we really need to do is start looking at the disease process, make sure that we uh, have clear examples, enforce those examples with legislation or retaliatory uh, oversight, and then you are going to get compliance in a lot more other aspects. So I would like, for the record, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, an example of the drug shortages as of yesterday to be placed in the record. Without objection. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Desjardins. General, I want to ask you about two areas. Um, first, weather satellite. I am asked from time to time, which is tough for a lawyer to understand the, the science. And so can you help me understand how we got to this crisis and, and what uh, an acceptable remedy would be? Uh, for it. Yes. I am going to ask the Dave Ponder, our expert in this area, to come up and he will give you a great explanation. Okay. Though. Great. Thanks. Well, Congressman, this is uh, an area that kind of grew over the years. We had a uh, uh, tri agency program to put in place polar orbiting satellites. If you go back several years, there is a long history of cost overruns, technical problems, mismanagement of the program. What happened was the launch dates kept getting pushed. And what we did is we kept buying time with operational satellites. If you fast forward now, currently, we are in a situation where in the 2016 time frame, there is a satellite that basically is going to reach the end of its useful life, and we are not launching until 2017. That is the best case situation. That provides about a 17-month gap in satellite coverage. And depending on if that satellite lasts less than what is expected or if there is any further delays, that gap in satellite coverage could actually be more. So we are looking anywhere from a 17- to 53-month gap in satellite coverage. Our recommendations to NOAA has been to put in place contingency plans to address those gaps. What do you expect those contingency plans to include? Uh, a couple things. One is you could look at uh, one extending the current life of the existing satellites. There's things you can currently do with that. Uh, there's possibility of moving up the launch of the current dates. Those are uh, unrealistic uh, in some ways, but there's possibilities if you look at those various schedules. And then if you look at the contingency plans that need to be put in place, uh, various things. You can use other government satellites from DOD, foreign satellites are an option, other weather observations are an option. 
But all those have certain things that go with it. So, for instance, if you use European satellites, there's changes to our ground stations. So there are associated costs with all those different contingency plans. Do, and do you think there is a reasonable probability of a gap, a gap that would have significant consequences to us? Right now, there is a high probability of a gap that could be 17 months. Wow. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, General, last area, uh, my colleague from Maryland very um, appropriately and commendably remembered uh, a doctor from Charleston, South Carolina, Michelle Hudspeth, who came and testified uh, quite emotionally about having to choose between which of her pediatric cancer patients she was going to treat because of a drug shortage. So, again, uh, for, for folks who may not be following this issue, just watching from back home, how did we get in this circumstance? And with specificity, particularly for those who clamor for bipartisanship, because it exists on this issue, but Mr. Issa and Mr. Cummings both would move heaven and earth tomorrow, if they could, to eliminate the shortage. So what legislatively or from an oversight perspective can we do to remedy the drug shortage? Well, the, the first step was uh, taken in the last FDA Modernization Act last year, which gave FDA the authority to require manufacturers to notify them. Now, that was part of the problem, step one. In order for them to do something about it, they needed to have adequate information to know about those issues. So that aspect has taken uh, shape now. But the qu question is, what are we going to do with that authority to turn it into action to try to provide uh, adequate information. I will go back and, for the record, as I mentioned to Congressman Gosher, provide additional recommendations on things that could be done in this area. We have uh, a, an expert team. They just don't happen to be here today, uh, but we will provide you more specific suggestions. Well, we, we would be grateful because, again, I, I, I know that there is a, uh, there is a desire all across this dais for, um, for action. And, and for those who desire uh, work across the aisle, which I think uh, includes uh, all of us, this would be a very appropriate way. So we would, we would be very um, anxious to see your recommendations. And with that, I would yield back uh, to Dr. Desjardins. I thank the gentleman. And uh, I will go in, be going to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Cartwright, for five minutes. And I want to apologize to the gentleman from uh, Nevada, Mr. Horsford. I did not see you there. So we will go next to you right after Mr. Cartwright. Uh, the, the gentleman uh, from Pennsylvania is recommended, or recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, Mr. Dodaro, according to the United States Global Change Research Program, uh, the impacts and costliness of weather disasters uh, resulting from floods, droughts, and other events such as tropical cyclones will increase in significance as what are considered rare events, quote, unquote, become more common and intense due to climate change. Now, the Federal Government's crop insurance costs have increased in recent years, rising from an average of $3.1 billion per year from fiscal years 2000 to 2006 to an average of $7.6 billion a year uh, from fiscal years 2000 through 2012 and are projected to increase further. Do we, do, do we have a sense of the scale by which climate change will increase the Federal fiscal exposure for the National Flood Insurance Program uh, and the Federal Crop Insurance Corporation? Yeah, I don't have uh, you know, estimates of, of that regard, uh, but I, I am concerned about the potential magnitude, given on what we have spent so far to respond to these issues. So we are going to be looking at the quantification issues, if you will, as we uh, delve into this issue in the future. Well, that leads to my next question. I, I suspected you might, you might say that. And, uh, is a study needed to look at those issues further, sir? Yeah, uh, I, I believe so. Uh, but it will, uh, as with many of these areas, be difficult to, to come up with uh, some areas. But I, I think we can, uh, uh, we have some work underway in that area right now. We will be happy to pr brief you on that and provide the results when they are ready. Thank you. Uh, and secondly, uh, GAO uh, recommended in May of 2011 uh, that the appropriate entities within the Executive Office of the President 
clearly establish Federal strategic climate change priorities, including the roles and responsibilities of the key Federal entities, taking into consideration the full range of climate-related activities. In 2009, GAO also recommended that the appropriate entities within the Executive Office of the President develop a strategic plan to guide the Nation's efforts to adapt to climate change. Now, furthermore, Federal agencies released draft climate change adaptation plans on February 9 as part of their strategic sustainability performance plans required by Executive Order 13514 on Federal leadership in environmental, energy, and economic performance. The USGCRP also has a strategic plan for climate change science research. My question is, how are agency adaptation plans being coordinated across the Federal Government? Yeah, that, that's our main point. We, we believe you know, they have the plans, but they are not being coordinated as well as they need to be. And, and, and do these plans amount to a government-wide strategic plan at this point? Not, not in our view. And that is one of our main recommendations. And we plan to work with the, the, the Executive Office of the President and the Office of Science, Technology and Policy to, to help underscore what needs to be done. Uh, well, I thank you for that answer. And I want to say that is why I will be working with the GAO to address two specific concerns they have highlighted in this report. First, I will be working with the GAO to find the best possible way to coordinate the various adaptation reports required by the Executive Order uh, and to come up with a national strategic plan to prepare for this grave threat. Uh, so I thank you uh, for your appearance here today. Uh, and, Mr. Chairman, I yield back my remaining time. I thank the gentleman. And again, thank you for your patience, Mr. Horsford. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman from Nevada for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, General. I want to commend you and your team uh, for what is a very good blueprint for the critical challenges that are facing uh, our Federal agencies, and not only that you identify the high-risk areas, but you also outline what needs to be done. Uh, and I would point out what needs to be done by Congress uh, in large part to move some of these issues forward. Um, my focus uh, I would like to turn to is transportation. Uh, the GA GAO uh, report lists funding for the Nation's service, uh, surface transportation system as an area of high risk uh, for the government. And the Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century Act uh, which was enacted last year, provides some certainty for States, but it also reduces overall funding for highways relative to fiscal year 2011. And it will not provide the funding that we know that we need to bring our infrastructure to a state of good repair overall. Um, I am from Nevada, and our unemployment rate is still stubbornly high. Uh, our number two industry has been the construction industry, and in large part, uh, my focus is on how we can create jobs and get our economy moving while at the same time investing in critical infrastructure needs. Uh, so the report indicates that of the 18.4 cent per gallon tax on gasoline that was enacted in 1993, it's only worth about 11.5 uh, cents today. Uh, the report goes on to note that uh, the CBO has estimated that it will take $110 billion in additional revenues to maintain current levels of, of spending plus inflation through 2022. So in, short, in the short term, are there any realistic alternatives to the gas tax to fund transportation that would maintain the user pays principles uh, that have been at the heart of transportation funding uh, in the past. Yeah, I'm going to ask. Uh, I'll, I'll start out and first, but Phil, come th please. Uh, I'm going to ask Phil Hers, our transportation expert. I'll, I'll let him talk. In the mean, uh, unfortunately, the uh, approach that's been used in the last several years is to use general fund appropriations in order to supplement the lack of funds from the Highway Trust Fund to be able to do that. That is not a long-term answer. 
uh, to, to the situation, particularly given the Federal Government's deficit and debt issues. So other things need to be looked at, uh, but that is the main reason it is on the list, uh, is, is order to try to get the Congress to come to grips with the financing structures there. But let me have Phil elaborate, Congressman. Uh, we have done some additional work. There is a, a program that uh, has been expanded under MAP 21 called TIFIA, which is a loan program that uh, helps uh, incentivize private investment uh, in infrastructure. Uh, we have also completed some recent work that talks about other options for collecting revenue uh, that would supplement the gas tax as well, but those are obviously involved some policy tradeoffs. But there are, there are options there, but uh, you correctly point out uh, what some of the limitations of the gas tax are. So if I could, Mr. Chairman, just follow up. So with the provision that requires States to spend a specified portion of their allocations, their annual allocations on the improvement of bridges and, and uh, interstate pavement, uh, should what happens if the conditions fall below those standards? And are there considerations given to States to use other types of funding sources to make up uh, the gap? It's an interesting question. This was just enacted with MAP 21, so DOT is still working with the States to set some of those targets and some of what the processes would be. But our understanding is with the legislative fix that was put in with MAP 21, States would need to dedicate money to some of these national uh, projects that have more national significance. Can they backfill with any additional funding outside? I would have to get back to you for the record to see how they are rolling this out. Okay. And, and just to close, on the Passenger Rail Investment Improvement Act of 2008, again, this is a critical opp opportunity for uh, our need to connect Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Uh, what risks has GAO, GAO identified with this program, and what happens if continued Federal investment is not uh, available to achieve the goals? Uh, in, in, in the high risk or the, uh, the uh, high speed rail, uh, we actually have had some, uh, we have some work ongoing now, but in a, a recent testimony one of my colleagues gave, uh, we identified some problems with some of the cost estimates that are made available uh, seeking Federal funding. So we are uh, looking at ways that some of those could be improved so uh, decision makers would have better information. Uh, the other thing, though, is in many cases high speed rail is quite expensive. And so, uh, for example, in the California high-speed rail uh, situation, their proposal now is calling for a fairly large Federal investment, about $38 billion, so, and then also some private funds. So a real challenge in that area is getting the money to build these and then actually implement them and carry them forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Meadows, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for coming to, to uh, share your perspective today. I, I want to take a little bit broader uh, brush approach as, as we start to look at this. You know, your report highlights some of the needs for a performance matrix, uh, as, as you would put it. And so, in, in what way can we look at departments and agencies? Uh, providing information so that we as Congress can make a better decision in terms of uh, tying that to the budget or appropriations? Uh, and, and what role do you see OMB playing in that, if any? We have been advocating for a number of years a systematic approach, as you mentioned, to measuring performance against established goals in the Federal Government. There was legislation passed in 1993. The Modernization Act on that was passed in 2010. And it is really important to your point, because agencies are supposed to consult with the Congress, establish goals and measures for all Federal programs and activities, and then to provide regular progress reports against those goals. So that process now is in its early stages of getting established. We have a role in evaluating whether or not the agencies are doing that. OMB has the responsibility for the lead in that area. And it is not only goals for individual agencies and departments, but it is cross-cutting goals in a number of areas as well, where multiple agencies uh, provide funding to support an overall government-wide goal. So there is an established mechanism to do it, but it has to be done properly and well. I am pleased to see that the law now requires more consultation with the Congress 
And we are going to make sure that that actually is taking place. How, how can you make sure that that takes place? Because you know, we are in the land of, of promises here that right. says we are going to have this plan and ultimately this is right. going to lead to a more effective and accountable government, and yet here we are with, without that. Right. No, well, we are going to uh, follow through on the facts to see what the agencies have to tell us exactly who they have consulted with, and the, and the law requires them to not only say that, but what they have done with the advice that they have received from the Congress. Now, we are going to make sure that works. We are going to talk to members of Congress and, and their staffs. And uh, I would ask uh, Chris Mims, our expert in this area, if he wants to elaborate a little bit further. But we are doing work in that area. I am going to make sure it is done. All right. And as the Controller General mentioned, sir, is that there are requirements, statutory requirements now, that there for more robust and continuing consultation on the part of agencies with the Congress and other key stakeholders. One of the things that we have also been making offers to do, working with committee staff here on this committee and over on the Senate side, is to work with, work with members of Congress to help them extract that information from agencies. That is, to have the, not just have it be on the demands or allow the agencies to come up, but to have Congress start saying, we are ready for the consultation. We want to start talk to, talking to you about where you are and your goals and your performance and your strategic goals. And so we remain available to, to work with you and your office and your colleagues on those issues. All right. And, and while you are still there, let, let's look at this. So let's talk about this performance matrix. And as it comes back to maybe fragmentation, you know, as, as was highlighted, so you, you've got 45 programs across nine different agencies, as, as you had in your testimony. How do you put together a performance matrix? without people pointing the finger at this agency or that agency didn't meet our overall goal when, when we haven't consolidated under, under one head? The, uh, it, well, the point that you are raising, sir, was exactly one of the two major reasons that Congress had in mind when they passed the Modernization Act. Sure. We had had requirements for many years to do strategic planning and annual planning. That was all agency-based. And what Congress is looking for with the Modernization Act is a more integrated and cross-cutting perspective. And so it requires OMB, on behalf of the President, to have some government-wide cross-cutting goals, but also agencies in their goals to identify who else are, what other agencies are involved in the delivery of, of products and services that are related to the result that they are trying to achieve. One of the things that we have been doing, we will have a report coming out on this shortly, is taking a sample of the goals that the agencies have, have uh, established and begin to start looking at those and seeing have they identified relevant partners um, that, that we had otherwise identified as part of our work on overlap and duplication or that the inspectors general had identified, and then following up and seeing, hey, you, you seem to have missed someone that is key to your, your success, why is that and how are you coordinating with them to make sure that we don't have the overlap and duplication that you are talking about? But you are hitting on a very important point, and, then, and there really is no systematic way that this has been done in the past and really needs, this needs to work if, if we are going to deal with this in a timely way. And so is, is that something that you take the lead on? Who, who takes the lead on now, that? OMB has the responsibility to implement the law. We have the responsibility to make sure that they are doing it effectively and providing oversight on behalf of the Congress. Okay. Thank you very much. I yield back. Uh, thank the gentleman. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from California, Mrs. Speer. Mr. Chairman, thank you. And Mr. Um, Mr. General, let me, let me say that I once again am deeply grateful for the work that you and your staff does on behalf of the American people. Mr. Chairman, this really should be our Bible in this committee. We should take every section of this report and in subcommittees and in full committees go through it and save the taxpayers of this country money. By your own uh, earlier testimony, you said there is tens of billions of dollars. Are you in a position to tell us how much would be saved? by each of the recommendations that you have made? Uh, it would be hard to give you a precise estimate, but, I mean, just for example, in the Medicare program alone, uh, there are the latest estimates of $44 billion in improper payments, so driving that down will save money. We have made recommendations that this uh, pilot program that they have in Medicare Advantage be canceled that if timely action had been taken there, that was $8.3 billion. So if we were to take action to this year to cancel that program, 
and just do the bonus payments as you recommend, right. how much would we save? Uh, I, I believe, I, I, don't hold me to the estimate, but it is about between 2 and $3 billion. All right. There is 2 to $3 billion, Mr. Chairman, right. that if this committee gets serious about really taking the recommendations of the Auditor General, we would be in a position to really say we are saving people money in this country. I also noted that under the health care area, you looked at self-referral. It continues to be a problem where physicians that own an interest in a uh, high um, advanced imaging center uh, tend to refer more, and the figure was hundreds of millions of dollars, if I am not yeah, I, I don't have it off the top. I will provide it for the record. But it was a significant amount of money and a high, high percentage. So do you ever get frustrated that you make all these recommendations and years go by and nothing happens? A actually, believe it or not, uh, 80 percent of our recommendations are implemented over a four-year period of time. And that has been pretty consistent over time. We keep coming up with new recommendations. For example, we in the past uh, at FHA, uh, we asked Congress to act a prohibited seller uh, finance down payment uh, and assistance, and that saved over $10 billion. Because All right. Of okay. So there is some good news. Let me right. move on to another topic, uh, Department of Defense. Mm -hmm. The Air Force just canceled a ECSS contract that was already that we had already spent a billion dollars on, and this is a contract that I've asked the committee. Um, to explore in kind of a, a post-mortem to find out what went wrong. There was an Inspector General report that recommended that they should cut it off. We didn't do it. At some point, we in Congress have to take responsibility for not acting. Now, there is another uh, report, I believe, Computer Science Corporation is the primary contractor for ECSS project has also been awarded a contract for another enterprise resource planning system called the LMP, just another acronym, but it is for Logistics Modernization Program, and it is intended to streamline the Army's inventory of weapon systems. Having said that, um, the Inspector General for Auditing within DOD has recommended that they not spend any more additional money on top of the $1.1 billion already spent on the program back in 2009. So what did we do? We continue to spend money. It now is $4 billion over budget and 12 and a half years behind schedule. When do we stop and say it is enough? When do we stop contracting with the same contractors that are over budget, that don't do the job, and you know, go back to square one? How would you address that issue? Well, uh, first of all, in the rules, the contractors pass performance is performance is supposed to be considered in, in making well, obviously in funding, not here. funding decisions. Well, there are timing issues in terms of when the different contracts would have been let, who knew what where, and importantly, within the Department of Defense, who is sharing information across the Department to ensure this doesn't happen? You know, in the past, we have looked at whether or not uh, people who are on the debarred list are getting contracts, and, uh, and we found that in some cases agencies didn't check that list before they went ahead and made procurement decisions. Of the th contracting has been on our high risk list for a long time. The procurement process uh, doesn't always work effectively, and there are high dollar consequences to it. I, I would welcome congressional oversight and more attention to these areas, particularly in the Department of Defense, where we spend most of this contracting money. If we made a request of you to do a post mortem on the ECSS program, would you be able to do that? Yes. All right. Thank you. I thank the gentlelady. The chair will now recon recognize himself for five minutes for a uh, line of questioning. Mr. Dare, I would like to focus a little bit on health care. Um, Medicare and Medicaid are both uh, perpetually on the high risk list, Medicaid, or Medicare for two decades, uh, Medicaid for a decade. Uh, together, they are responsible for over 58 percent of all government improper payments. Uh, in fiscal year 2012. What recommendation does GAO make about improving their program integrity and stopping improper payments? Well, a number of recommendations we have made at almost every phase of their process. For example, enrolling providers. We need to keep bad actors out of the system initially. 
uh, we have made recommendations that the, 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 there be surety bonds put up by the providers before they are enrolled in the programs, and yet that hasn't taken place yet. We think that is important so that the Federal Government, if there is a problem, can get the money back. We have recommended that there be more analytical uh, procedures in, in place, data analytics, to spot trends and fraud in the provider uh, area up front. Uh, they have moved it forward on that area, but they haven't linked it to the payment system yet, so that if, if they do find a potential problem, they don't stop the payments until they sort through the problem. Then, before, once you get providers in, making the payments, uh, uh, doing a good review before you make the payments in the first place. This prevention and detection area before you make the payments really needs a lot more attention. And so we have made a lot of suggestions there on how to improve the prepayment controls, that they are not standardizing the edits across the providers, uh, the contractors who make the payments. Uh, then there is after the payments are made, uh, making sure that there is post uh, look at this area. We have made recommendations there. And then when we find that there is an improper payment that has been made, having a recovery audit and go in and, and recoup the money back. So at every level in the process, there is a need for reform. We have made many recommendations. I can provide the details for the okay. records, but, but I, uh, this, this is an area that we have a high degree of attention on and has a lot of potential payback. Well, as we should, with that, that number is pretty alarming. And would you agree that there is no future threat to the solvency of our country greater than health care? Uh, health care is the primary driver of our uh, projected deficits. Okay. The uh, Patient Protection Affordable Care Act uh, establishes requirement for center Medicare and Medicaid services to improve the integrity. Uh, the high risk list notes that CMS should implement some of the requirements under the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act uh, to improve this uh, integrity. Why hasn't CMS done this? Uh, I can provide some answers for the record. It depends on which area you are talking about. The, the, the uh, process over there, in my opinion, takes longer than it needs to to implement these, these changes. Okay. But I can provide more specifics. Okay. Well, I would appreciate that, considering the you know, 20 years on the high-risk list. I think that we certainly need to target that. Um, with uh, the health care bill, just really eight months away, the implementation, uh, the IRS has a large role in implementing the health care bill and the insurance exchanges, uh, which should be in place in less than eight months. Um, what impact will the IRS's system modernization problems have on health care delivery in the United States? Uh, let me ask uh, Chris to come to the table to talk okay. about that. Because you know, we, we had a hearing on this in the last Congress, and, and uh, we know that the IRS was really, frankly, not ready for all that is going to be required of them. There is going to be incredible interaction between uh, future patients and the IRS, lots of reporting that has to go on, whether you move, whether you have a child, whether there is a divorce, a death, et cetera. Constant communication is required, and I think we established the wait time for someone to call the IRS to be like 55 minutes. So can you comment on where we are going to be in eight months uh, as, as a physician and, and someone who talks to a lot of physicians? We are not terribly optimistic that this is shovel ready. There is a, a couple of issues that you are raising there, of course, sir. One is just on the wait time. I mean, we have seen that, of course, during the filing season, that there was a uh, just the, the, the IRS is just in this last year it didn't come close to meeting its goals in terms of how many people were able to get through and, and you know, did they get wait, uh, busy signals or dropped calls and all the rest. We have made some recommendations to them that the, just in, on the filing season aspect that they, which, but has implications for what you are talking about, they need to do a much better job in thinking in a broad strategic sense across the various ways that they interact with the public, being walk-in centers, uh, correspondence, uh, telephone calls, information that individuals that, that they can get through the Web, and the Web is obviously over the long term the way to go. Is it realistic to believe they can be even close to ready in eight months? The, uh, what we have seen, in, um, more specifically on the Affordable Care Act, we have we've done a number of uh, engagements or a number of reports that have looked at where they are on that, in particular how their infrastructure, that is, their, their governance infrastructure and risk management is, is, is looking. I would agree with your, your, your point that, uh, that they have some major risks 
that they are going to have to be able to manage in order to effectively deliver this, because they have, obviously, the, the implementation of, or their responsibilities for implementation of Affordable Care Act. They have a very difficult filing season that is you know, ahead of them. Um, they have other challenges that IRS uh, faces, and so it is going to be quite a, quite a difficult challenge for them. It is something that we continue to monitor on behalf of the Congress. And, and as you know, there are still uh, challenges out there regarding Federal and State exchanges with the IRS uh, in, in terms of that ruling. That has also been a subject of a hearing that we will revisit. I see my time has expired. Seeing no other Democrat, Democratic witnesses, uh, I will now uh, yield five minutes to my good friend and colleague from Tennessee, Mr. Duncan. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I don't have any questions, but I did want to say a couple of things. Um, first of all, I agree with the gentlewoman from California that this is a very important uh, subject, and I hope the GAO stays on top, top of this and continues to issue these uh, reports. And I appreciate uh, your work, um, Mr. Dodaro, and that of your staff. And I agree with the gentleman from Pennsylvania. And the, I, I also have concern about the uh, National Flood Insurance Program, because I read uh, recently that uh, 15 of the largest insurance companies are making a real killing off of that uh, program. I think that is something that we need to look into. But when I read the committee memo, it mentions as the biggest, of course, programs, um, Medicare and Medicaid and, and um, the Department of Defense. And I was here earlier to, this morning uh, for the discussion on the New York Medicaid program, and they said there was $15 billion in improper payments just in that one program, the, the New York Medicaid program, and that there was one contract paying a $5,000 daily rate for uh, uh, institutionalized uh, uh, people. Uh, I can tell you, um, almost every Federal contract with, uh, in every Federal Department agency is some sort of sweetheart insider type deal. And I, I would bet that that, uh, that that contract certainly was. And, it, and the Department, of, and, and we now spend, according to some of the information we were given this morning, $990 billion on the two programs, Medicare and Medicaid, put together. That is more money than uh, uh, almost all the other countries in the world spend total in their complete budgets put together. And uh, uh, th these costs are just unbelievable. And when people say we can't cut Medicare and so forth, well, I don't want to cut any, any uh, uh, poor person out of the Medicare and Medicaid, but I will tell you this, there is a lot of people in companies getting ridiculously rich off of Medicare and Medicaid, and some of those payments need to be, and some of those contracts need to be looked into. And uh, uh, then the Department of Defense, all those defense contractors, they hire all the retired admirals and generals. And then they come back to the um, offices that they rent and they get contracts. And it seems to me that that is rampant in Medicare, Medicaid, the Department of Defense, and throughout the Federal Government, that uh, they hire uh, Federal employees who take who retire at a fairly um, uh, young, at fairly young ages on average, and then they go back and they get these contracts in the, uh, from the departments or the agencies that they work for, and it's crooked. It ought to be against the law, and uh, I hope that uh, in future reports you'll point to, uh, some things like that out too, Mr. Dodaro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. And, uh, Mr. Dodaro, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule today. Oh, and I'm, I'm sorry, I yield to the ranking member for a, a statement. I just want to, um, just uh, as we close, uh, again, I want to thank you and your staff for your excellent report. I want to just say, Mr. Duncan, who just spoke. Mr. Duncan, yes. Um, I, I, he's, he just, what he said is just so important. Um, we, you know, we talk about waste, fraud, and abuse, and sometimes I think we, you know, we kind of talk about it and as if um, it's just a lightweight thing. But as Mr. Duncan pointed out, this is serious stuff. And when we talk about trying to figure out how we uh, save money and all that, you know, I just want you, <clears throat> you all do a great job, <clears throat> but I want you to continue to try to show us how we can be more effective and efficient in uh, rooting out some of this waste, fraud, and abuse, because it is real. I think we kind of just say it and 
you know, and a lot of times we are not really digging deep to get to it. It may call for us highlighting just very bad actors. It may call for us making sure that things get referred to the proper authorities, like justice or whatever. But we have got to get to this, because if we have got the kind of money that he was just talking about, just going out the door and some folk getting rich, but at the same time the money not going to the very folk that we intended to go to, it just seems like, you know, maybe we need to zero in on, okay, now, how do we go from research to truly being effective and efficient in making that research uh, have some, you know, bear some fruit? Uh, there is nothing I hate more than research that, bit, that gets placed on a shelf only to be dusted off and put in a microwave five years later or ten years later and reissued. And the problem just keeps going on and on and on. And so uh, I just hope that, you know, uh, I know your staff is very focused. I know they want to want to make sure they do the right thing. And, like, again, I just want you all to do everything in your power to help us be even more effective and efficient even than we are. All right? Will the gentleman yield? Of course. Um, I, I just want to associate my remarks with those of yours and those of Mr. Duncan's. You know, there were very few members here today. This should be a mandatory meeting for every member of this committee, because this particular report of high-risk problems in the U.S. government should be something that every member of this committee is familiar with, and it should be the, the roadmap for much of the work that we do in our subcommittees. And I know you are serious about making some inroads in terms of getting rid of the fraud and abuse. I know that the general is and all the staff that works with him. We have got to work together to resolve this, because otherwise it is just all cheap talk. Yeah. I yield well, back. I must say that, in credit, Chairman, as I just take 30 more seconds, to uh, Chairman Issa this morning in our press conference, he recommitted to making sure that we, we do those things that we are talking about so that we could be more effective and efficient. And that is why I was just saying to you, Mr. Dodaro, if there are things that you can help us with so that we can, I know you got your recommendations and whatever, right. but again, you know, you know what, I, you know, one of the things I, I, I worry about is that when I look back on my tenure as a congressman, uh, I don't want to look back with regret that I failed to do the things that I could have done to help my constituents. And so sometimes maybe we need help, maybe we need tools, maybe we need advice. Uh, and if you, if you're, your staff, Maybe we need a new era of how to, to, to really uh, take these reports and bring life to them. Because, you know, those wonderful people, uh, great government servants sitting behind you, many of whom, probably all of whom, could be making more money doing other things, but they come to government service to feed their souls, to feed their souls. And they come to make a difference. And I want them in feeding their souls to be effective, too. I don't want them to say, well, you know, we gave a report and it got placed on a shelf and, you know, it never went anywhere. And so at some time, at some point, then their morale goes down. And that, and, and, I mean, it can, I mean, it's just logical. So, uh, again, I want to thank you. But you were about to say something and then I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I, I would just like to make a couple of points in regard to your comments, Mr. Cumming, uh, Congresswoman Speer. Uh, number one is the high risk program will remain a top priority for GAO as long as I'm Controller General. My term goes to 2025. I made a commitment in my confirmation hearing that uh, this would be a high priority. It will remain so. Uh, the second point. I would say one of the things that could be done uh, that this committee could talk about is assigning some of the high-risk areas to either the subcommittees or individual members on the committee so that they can become well-versed and deep in these issues and we could work with them. Uh, that has been done in the past, and uh, there was a high-risk caucus at one point in the Congress when we first started the programs, and it had some good effect. And they could work, put more pressure on the agencies or understand the issues deeper, so I would say do that. Uh, third point, my last point, uh, is that you can do some things to help us. Uh, we are at our lowest staffing level since 1935. 
Now, obviously, the Federal Government is in a much different position now than it was in 1935. Uh, we need some help, not a lot. We return $105 for every dollar spent on GAO this past year. We had more than $55 billion in documented financial benefits as a result of implementing our recommendations. Over the last decade, that comes to about a half a trillion dollars. So we think we are a good investment, uh, but we need some help. And so we appreciate whatever this committee could do. So thank you very much. It has been a privilege to be here today. And you have our commitment that myself and all the dedicated and talented people at the GAO are at your disposal to make headway in making government more efficient and effective on, for the benefit of the American people. I thank you for that. I thank the ranking member and certainly I thank Ms. Spears for her comment. And in the spirit of, spirit of summarization, I will add, for all those folks that are watching this hearing today, I agree this is an incredibly important issue as we look at our out-of-control debt deficit and spending problems. Uh, we, we hear calls for revenue increases and for American people watching this hearing and listening to the, the high-risk list and how long things have been on the high-risk list, I think they would be very discouraged, if not disgusted, that we are not doing better. And I think it would be a shame to ask the American people to, for another dime of revenue till we start to solve these problems. So in that spirit, I am looking forward to working uh, with my colleagues and addressing these important issues. So again, I will thank you for taking time out of your busy, busy schedule, as well as your staff, uh, to appear before us today. And uh, the committee stands adjourned.